I'm starting to think this is a sign that the universe does not want us to record this episode. Right. <laughs> Are you nostalgic? A parent? Or perhaps a child at heart? When it comes to children's media, from books to TV shows, and even movies, there's often more than meets the eye. Is it well written? Does it still hold up today? What works and what doesn't? Or maybe you wonder what went on behind the scenes of that work. Together, a trio of adults, who are also kids at heart, will critique and comment on one piece of children's media each episode. Hello, this is Eric. Hi, I'm PJ. And I'm Rico. You're listening to Beyond the Lens, a family-friendly podcast. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to uh, a new episode and a new season of Beyond the Lens. I'm Rico, and I'll, I'm joined once again by PJ. Hello. Okay, and uh, as you may have noticed, Eric is not here. In fact, he will be sort of MIA this entire season for personal reasons, but I hope that that might change maybe one point in the future, but he's always welcome around here. So basically, before we get into today's topic, I sort of figured I would sort of give people sort of a little as far as what happened to it, because essentially we preempted a uh, episode on today's topic, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, uh, and then eventually that just never happened. So uh, basically, the, the three of us, me, PJ, and Eric, we all live in different time zones, and scheduling sort of became difficult, and it was difficult for the episodes we did record. And eventually sort of just lost interest in continuing the season and pursued other creative endeavors. And then, of course, the whole pandemic happened. Uh, and I did think about picking it up again at that point, but there were other creative projects that t- took priority for me. Returning to Beyond the Lens has always been something in the back of my mind, but I just never got around to picking it back up again until recently so obviously it's been been a few years so before we get started uh pg is there anything you want to say that sort of happened with you in the past few years because i know a lot happened yeah i mean i think you said everything perfectly it's just we're all in different time zones we were doing different things the pandemic has really changed a lot of the projects that we've been doing um i've been trying to keep busy with more modeling projects because they're more COVID safe at the moment. But the, I guess the disadvantage to doing that is you can schedule modeling projects back to back because they don't take as much time as acting projects would do. So I are acting projects would, I should say. And so I've been busy with a lot of modeling projects and doing a lot of voiceover stuff. So I was also thinking about you know, coming back to Beyond the Lens, because this is something that I've always enjoyed doing. It's um, also from the comfort of our homes, and that's that's been helpful as well. Um, but I, I think, like Rico said, it's just a lot of other projects have been going on. Um, but like like him, this, this uh, podcast has always been in the back of my mind as well, and I definitely have not forgot about it. I haven't forgotten about our audience, so I'm just really happy to be back. So now that's out of the way, we can get get sort of started on uh, today's topic. So, which is Mr. Rogers' neighborhood and sort of Fred Rogers and his legacy, as well as going into the recent spinoff, Daniel Tiger's neighborhood. So, PJ, how familiar are you with that? Um. Now, this is kind of long, but I promise it has a point. So I I remember watching the original Mr. Rogers Neighborhood when I was very little. I think I was around, I want to say one or two when I first started watching it. But of course, when you're that young, you don't really remember much of it. And the one thing I do remember was that um, I was in Disneyland when this happened for the very first time. Um, and we were in a hotel room. And this is weird because this is the only thing I remember <laughs> from that trip other than one other thing. But I remember walking to my in, into our hotel room and 
I hear my mom say in like a very somber voice. And she, she said, Oh, Mr. Rogers died. And I'm like, what? That, that guy I see all the time on TV. What are, we, what are you talking about? And you know, when you're five years old, you don't really understand the concept of death yet. And so I just thought, Oh, maybe he went away for a while. I, you know, I kind of looked at the newspaper that was on the side bed and saw that his picture was on it. And I'm like, Oh, so he's just gone away. But then my mom would try, would try explaining to me, no, he's, he's not here anymore. And so when I started watching the show after that point, I got kind of confused. I'm like, but he's, he's not supposed to be there. Like he's, he's gone. And so after he passed away, I kind of stopped watching the show, but I remember very little bits of information about it. I know some of the characters. I know that he always started the show with taking his sweater vest off. And uh, I think putting it in his closet or something, but it's just, I, I don't remember much about the show, but I know that it had some impact on me when I was much younger. Since you brought it up, uh, when, when I first heard the news that, of the passing of Fred Rogers, uh, I, I was seven. Uh, I, I was getting up for, for school, I think. Uh, and usually at that time in the morning, my mom would play a Christian radio station. You know, like in the morning, there it's there's some music, but it's also a lot of talk. And then suddenly they started playing the little theme song for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood as they were talking about the news of his passing. And at that point, I was a little, I sort of, I sort of had a, what a concept as far as what death was, but I guess that's sort of ingrained in my memory as far as hearing the news of of his passing. Uh, like you said, I've seen uh, a lot of documentaries and movies that have come out in recent years about about uh, Mr. Rogers and legacy and his show. Uh, the the show's format is. Fred Rogers sort of sitting down, uh, talking to his audience, uh, sort of like, I always felt it was like sort of like visiting your grandparents for the day. It was sort of that sort of vibe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were times where he sort of went, went out of his uh, house, if you can call it that, the studio, and so so, so some interesting places. Uh, and another thing that sort of stood up to me was when uh, Mr. McFeely would come by and have some sort of film or something that showed various footage of like factories and how certain things were made, like how crayons were made or things like that. So, I mean, I thought it was interesting that it was a show involving, you know, real life people and then puppets and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it started off like in the real world. And then of course we went to the land of make-believe and yeah. it was with the puppets. I thought it was an interesting concept, how it went from real life to kind of this fictional world. And I've always wondered how they did the fictional world behind the scenes. I just thought that was super cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought that was cool. Uh, with the neighborhood of make-believe, like, uh, did, did you have a, favorite puppet or character from that world? Yeah, I mean, obviously I know of Daniel Tiger, which I'm sure we'll get into more later on as he has this sort of spinoff show. Um, he always kind of stood out to me as like the main character because that's I think that's the character we saw the most other than, um, oh gosh, I forget his name, but he's that king. Yeah, King Friday. King, king Friday, that's his name. Yeah, I think those two were kind of like the main characters and there were a few other side puppets that I, I can't remember, but I just remember Daniel standing out to me because he had this like big personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about you? Do you have a favorite character? I mean, so the, sort of the one place that's sort of in, ingrained in my memory is, uh, is I guess, the two because they were like right next to each other. Uh, Oh, the barn owl and uh, Henrietta Pussycat. Uh, I, oh, yeah, I remember her. Yeah. And one thing I, I believe I read as far as like 
earlier seasons is that uh, Henrietta like had very very few words that and her vocabulary sort of expanded as the show went on. She was the one that always placed a lot of words with meow and stuff. Oh, I think I'm I'm starting to remember that a little bit. I mean, I think yeah. I saw the later episode since uh, I didn't start. Well, I started watching it later. Like I think the show started. I, wasn't it in the late '80s when it first started airing, or was it earlier? It was actually earlier. Uh, before Sesame Street, in fact, I think it started like it's run on public television back in 1968. Oh shoot! I was I was way off. I I knew it like started early, but I didn't realize it was that old. Oh my goodness! Okay. Um. Um. Then yeah, I obviously you know didn't start watching until closer to when he passed away, since I was so young. So I probably have never seen the earlier episodes because I now that you mentioned Henrietta, like I, I'm starting to remember that she did have a little bit of a vocabulary. I didn't know that she didn't initially speak that much um, at the beginning of the series. Yeah, I'm again. I'm sort of with you. I've I've seen more of the later episodes, later seasons, because uh, I actually was born in the mid '90s. Uh, grew up in the early 2000s, so I'm more familiar with the later episodes of the show. Uh, it started in '68, and then it continued into the mid '70s, and at the time. Fed Rogers thought he like covered it all and was was ready for was ready for the show to end and have the show sort of continuing in reruns, but but then like at the at the turn of the decade there were all these news stories that came out with young kids uh, uh, getting injured and, and even dying from like sort of imitating superheroes and other characters they saw on TV mm. and and Roger sort of realized the uh gravity of the situation he felt like he had a duty to sort of of come back in that sense. That was like one of the many issues that brought him back. Uh and in fact I believe like one of the one of the first few episodes that aired he came back was was one where uh, Henrietta was imitating a superhero on TV in the neighborhood of make believe, and and obviously it's a kid's so she wasn't hurt or anything, but it helped start a conversation about that divide between uh, fantasy and imagination and the real world in that sense, sort of like fictional characters and stuff like that. Oh, okay. That's I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Yeah, Mr. Rogers was always was always sort of on the forefront of like trying to explain certain things like that to to kids. Uh, I, I guess we could get into this now. Uh, recent, well, actually, recent. before we before we do, I I did have well because now that you made that connection to. Mr. Rogers teaching about that real life versus fiction uh, world, uh, I guess, so to speak. That kind of reminds me of when we did Sesame Street and they kind of mm-hmm. talked about the concept of death to, to the kids. And yeah. I don't know if it's just me, but I kind of miss that about kids shows nowadays because they don't seem to go there very often. Like they try to hide it. And I wish yeah. that kids shows were more bold and taught kids at an early age. Hey, this is what happens in the real world sometimes. And I just thought it was really interesting that you brought that up. Uh, that reminds me of, of one of Mr. Rogers' things that he's known for is, is like whenever you see like all of the scary things happening on the news or on TV, his mother always told him to look for the helpers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, didn't she also knit like pretty much all of his sweaters on the show? That, I don't know. It could be. I think I read that somewhere. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, I think that's really sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess one thing that, that I also wanted to bring up was uh, sort of the the, the role uh, Fred Rogers had in helping legalize the VCR. Do you know anything about that? Um, unfortunately, I do not. So back when uh, 
the there were VCRs coming on uh, in the market, the Betamax and the VHS, with the in the middle of that format war. There, there was a lot of, of tension between the people making the technology and Hollywood. Uh, essentially, they viewed it as, as as simply nothing more than encourage customers of those devices to commit copyright infringement. And, and they actually sued Sony over the creation of the Betamax VCR Universal and Studios su- sued saying that since they're trying to hold Sony liable for uh, sort of contributing to the liability of, the, of people buying VCRs and copying shows and stuff. So, so one uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and one thing that sort of helped legalize, like sort of VCRs in the legal realm, was testimony from Fred Rogers, who stated that he saw the the benefits of the technology. How when stations aired, Mister Rogers' neighborhood, like during school hours or during a time where kids or their family couldn't sit down and watch the show, how the technology enabled them to, to record the show and then watch it back later. Oh, okay. And, and he didn't have a problem with that. And essentially, when it came time for the Supreme Court to decide, they, they ruled that, that recording... Uh, Shows and movies like that for time shifting purposes uh, was was considered to be a fair use, and then because the technology was capable of a substantial amount of non infringing activities, and that the technology was legal, and they couldn't sort of sue or hold those electronic companies liable for any infringement. Benjamin caused with the devices. So because of Mr. Rogers, people were able to record a show and that wouldn't be considered copyright infringement? Well, it, it essentially helped helped with the Supreme Court making the decision they did and that paved the way for it to be legal, yes. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I did not know about that. That's really awesome. I guess the next thing we can sort of talk about is the uh, is the spinoff uh, of, of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, that came out mm-hmm. a, f- a few years ago. Uh, it was created by, um, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this name, Angela Santoramo, something like that. She was a co-creator. I think you said it better than I could have, so... <laughs> She was a co-creator of Blue's Clues, uh, and she created the the spinoff essentially as like an as like an animated sort of show, which features ca- characters from the neighborhood of Make Believe. Now, now many of those characters have been depicted as like grown up, and now they have kids of their own. So there's Daniel Tiger, who's it was the son of the original Daniel Tiger in in Mr. Mr. Rogers show. So so there's that that element. And there's uh, it's a little bit more uh, shall we say interactive, sort of like blues clues. I sort of describe it as like a blues clues, Mr. Rogers neighborhood sort of hybrid. So would you, would you sort of agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I noticed it definitely was more interactive than Mr. the original Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And it's obviously animated. So it's that in that sort of sense, it relates to Blue's Clues more as well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess my question to you is how, how, how well do you think that the spinoff, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, sort of captures the spirit of the original show and the sort of continuation sort of thing. Now, I think I've only seen one full episode of Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, so I'm not too familiar with it. All I know is 
I think out of the dozens of kids that I babysat or nanny, I think only one or two of them know of the show. So it, I'm glad that they wanted to capture Mr. Rogers spirit and heart into entertainment for kids. I just wish it were more popular than it kind of is because it has that message of, you know, this is the spirit of Mr. Rogers and this is what he wanted for the world and why his message is so important about differentiating real life versus the fictional world. And um, I, I know that the show kind of follows Daniel in his different adventures. I don't know what they are per se, um, but overall, I think just the idea of having this spinoff and capturing that spirit is what really makes a difference already. And so I, I can appreciate that aspect. I just wish I was more familiar with the show and that they kind of, I guess I wish they advertised the show more and kind of, I guess, made it more well-known than it already is. Yeah, because Mr. Uh, Rogers was an important person. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar because my mentor's son uh, is really into Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Uh, That's so right. I remember you mentioning that. So I... So I, I've seen my fair share of fair, fair share of episodes. They seem to sort of follow a, a formula in a sense. Like the, the like each half hour episode is sort of split into t- two stories, uh, which you see common in animation. But they both deal with relatively speaking the same topic, and each topic actually has like some sort of song or jingle or, or something that sort of illustrates the theme or moral that they're trying to teach. Mm-hmm. So and the make-believe sort of aspect is sort of still there. Usually what happens is is the annual tiger asks the audience if if he wants to make believe with him and then they imagine various far out scenario sort of thing that it's sort of related to that episode of what's happening in the moment. Like there's one episode, like like so says to the audience, let's make believe that we're superheroes, for instance. And then, then there's this sort of imaginative segment of of what it would look like if he was an actual superhero, super Daniel, I think is what what they called it. And that imagination aspect it is is still there. As far as uh, whether the show uh, sort of captures the spirit of the original show, uh, I sort of agree with you that I think it needs to be sort of put out there, like pushed marketing-wise a bit more, but also sort of think uh, it's definitely a kid's show that is appropriate for that audience and stuff. One thing that I'm not as sure of is if, unfortunately, if Daniel Tiger is going to be sort of remembered in the same way when when the kids that are growing up with Daniel now, when they think back to the, to what they watch as a kid, as it does with us with remembering Mr. Rogers, neighborhood, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was going to say, I another thing I can appreciate about the show is that it reaches so many people. You have the new audience who's watching the show for the first time. And then, of course, you have people like us who have seen the original series and it's still entertaining. You can watch it with, you know, I used to enjoy watching it with my other nanny kids. And I really appreciated that aspect as well. Uh, I have two more questions sort of before we wrap up here. Uh... It's sort of tied together. The first one is, what do you think of Fred Rogers' legacy? And what do you think is his most important lesson or what lesson stuck with you the most? And those are both great questions. I mean, I still remember Fred Rogers to this day. His gentle and kind spirit is what really had the most impact on me he really did feel like a friend and that you were watching him through the TV and you felt like you knew him. And like what I really appreciated, especially as um, an autistic person watching the show, I always expected that same routine of him coming in, 
singing the won't you be my neighbor song and you know changing taking off his shoes putting away his sweater that routine is what kept me engaged with the show and the fact that he spoke to you so gently is what really made that difference for me and I think that's the impact that he's had on the world is just having that friend you can turn to and having that routine of him doing all those things and just him being there. I, I think he's just an incredible person. Yeah, I, I I fully agree. I sort of resonated with that soft, gentle tone as well. Uh, yeah, another thing that sort of uh, stuck with me uh, is the same, same thing that he says at the end of every show, which is roughly, you make each and every day special and you know how just by being you it's only one person in the whole world like you and people can like you just the way you are Mm -hmm. Uh, so so i guess do you have uh any last thoughts on mr rogers what it's a show him as a person or do you you have any last thoughts well i just realized i I think he actually put on his shoes, not taking them off, but I think people will understand what I was trying to say, but um, just, just that routine of him and him singing the song and his, his show, it it just, even though I don't remember the whole entire thing, just that little bit had enough impact on me. And I, I feel like overall, that's the impact that he had on the world and why he's so, um, I don't know the exact word, but that's why a lot of people remember him to this day. So I I think it was an incredible show and I don't think there's going to be anything like it ever again. Someone that's definitely going to be remembered for a very long time uh, of his various messages, uh, including one of inclusion, one thing that I, that I sort of got, uh, I believe this was an earlier episode where he, he introduced on the show a friend of his, an African American. He was on the show as That's a right. police yeah. officer, and he showed them uh, sort of. Uh, he broke that barrier. Yeah, how he how they together uh, like took their feet in in a pool. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I I believe you later said he got inspiration from that from from. The story in the Bible of Jesus watching washing the disciples' feet. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, he's he was, uh, I believe, uh, an ordained preps. I'm going to just try to pronounce this right. An ordained Presbyterian uh, priest or mm-hmm. pastor. Uh, so, uh, sort of his attitude towards. Uh, towards uh, children and sort of uh, all the lessons we taught is something that's going to be uh, remembered for for a long time, I think. Yeah, I mean, gosh, he was just such an incredible person. And, you know, rest in peace. We, we I think if he were alive today, the world would be much different. We need someone yeah. like him in today's society. So that does it for for today's episode of beyond the lens uh i hope you uh stay tuned because uh next next time uh i was th- i'm looking at our uh, our schedule uh i believe it's fetch isn't it yeah fetch yeah nice hopefully you'll hear us uh then so ha- have have a great day see ya see ya Thank you for listening to Beyond the Lens. The intro music is Work. That's W-E-R-Q by Kevin McCobb. It is available under a Creative Commons attribution license and can be downloaded for free at Incompetech.com. Beyond the Lens is a Recore Entertainment production.